I mean, we are all live on YouTube, so you can start. Yeah. Pass me the host. Yeah. Who am I passing it to? Uh, BIOS. BIOS. To BIOS, yeah? I mean, we are all live on YouTube, so you can start. Uh, Borida, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to this to? British Indian Orthopedic Society's educational webinar on meniscal repair devices and how to use them. Uh, my colleague Rahul Kotwal and I, Amit Chandratreya, are consultant knee surgeons at the Princess of Wales Hospital in Bridgend in Wales. Uh, thank you for giving up your time on this Saturday morning to attend this educational webinar. I hope you're safe and well. At this stage, BIOS would like to offer condolences to the royal family about the news yesterday. Can I have my first slide, please? please. So, so today's webinar, we are going to discuss about which meniscal repair device I use and why. Next slide, please. Our condolences to the royal So we are all aware of which meniscal tears require repair and which to excise. For joint preservation surgery, by trying to limit the amount of meniscus that can be removed, we are preventing future joint deterioration. To achieve this, the indi indications of repair are extending beyond the conventional ones. So like in this young patient with a bucket handle tear and a flap and a radial tear, we are making every attempt to repair this meniscus. In today's webinar, we are not discussing which tears to repair, but what devices we can use to achieve that repair. Most hospitals usually will have only one type of repair device on the shelf. And so the orthopedic surgeons may not be aware of the pros and cons of other meniscal devices. And because of the pandemic and no face-to-face -face meetings, uh, we have not been able to have a physical uh, handling of these repair devices. We therefore wanted to run this webinar, which aims to educate orthopedic surgeons on the current devices. Next slide, please. So to achieve this, we have managed to get this fantastic faculty to explain the meniscal repair devices they use and why. These surgeons are expert in the devices and they will demonstrate how each device works. They will share their experiences and pearls of wisdom on how these devices can be used to achieve a successful meniscal repair. Next slide, please. So we'll start off with uh, biomechanics of uh, meniscal repair, and the rest of the talks will be purely practical talks on uh, all inside and one inside out technique. We have talks about the fast T-fix, fiber stitch, and jugger stitch. Following that, we'll have a Q&A and discussion session and a little uh, break. After the break, we will learn about the Air Plus device, True Span, and also the zone specific for inside out techniques. We will then hear about personal experiences of knee surgeon of how meniscal repair has changed and evolved over the years. We finish off with the final discussion and a question and answer session. So please put all your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer this either during the webinar itself uh, or pick up the common questions in the discussion forum. We are live streaming through YouTube channel and also through Ortho TV channel. And I'd like to thank Dr. Ashok Sham personally for allowing us to do this. Uh, today, unfortunately, Dr. Alan Barber will not be joining us, but we'll have a specialist from j, &J to talk about TrueSpan. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So we start off with biomechanical conundrums. Mr. Martin Snow is an orthopedic consultant at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham and is also an honorary professor at the Birmingham and Aston University. He has numerous ongoing research projects and has published on joint preservation. So who better than him to give a talk on uh, meniscal devices? Can we please start Martin's presentation?
Uh, thanks, Amit, for the invite to uh, speak. My name is uh, Martin Snow. I'm a consultant uh, surgeon at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham. Uh, the title of my uh, talk is uh, The Biomechanics of... ...or inside meniscus uh, repair. So the advantages of all inside repair are that they principally avoid posterior incisions associated with a inside out repair. As a consequence, they are significantly quicker. Meta analyses have shown uh, that all inside repair is approximately 50% quicker than an inside out repair, which is obviously important in long cases which have multiple uh, components to it. They decrease the risk of neurovascular injury. And uh, the other advantage is that they can be used without an assistant. In terms of the literature, it's not extensive and it's quite heterogeneous, but this is sort of representative. Uh, this study here, when it uh, 954 meniscal repairs uh, on a mean age of 26 uh, years, the failure rate of the entire cohort was 22.5%. What they did show is that the early generation all inside uh, devices, such as the biosorbable arrows, has significantly more failures than the current modern day all inside sutures with uh, anchors. Medium meniscus repairs had a higher failure rate. Simultaneous ACL reconstruction resulted in less failure, and age at repair and time from injury did not affect the outcome. In terms of a single device uh, with the longest uh, follow-up, this is probably uh, the paper uh, of Joyce. So 63 patients underwent a meniscal repair using fast fix or fast T-fix, which is the early generation with the PLA blocks uh, between 2001-2003. Median 12-year uh, follow-up, 27% underwent further uh, meniscal surgery, therefore defined as a failure. The failure rate was significantly higher in females, 48% versus 15%, and significantly higher failure rate with football and indoor pivoting sports. If we put uh, all the comparative uh, studies uh, together for all inside versus inside out, this meta-analysis analyzed three randomized control trials and three prospective comparative studies. The healing rates between the two techniques were reported between 70 and uh, 93%. There was no significant difference in clinical outcomes between the two uh, techniques. Uh, meniscal healing rates were very similar and uh, the perioperative complications between the all inside and inside out techniques were also uh, similar. That's the conclusion of the paper was that both all inside and inside out meniscal suture techniques are equally uh, effective. So which device? So you're gonna hear uh, some talks uh, after this from some excellent surgeons who uh, are going to be proponents of the main devices on the market. Biomechanically, there is not a, massive amount of uh, data. Probably the best biomechanical study is performed by Alan Barber, who I believe is speaking later uh, today. The important thing is that uh, this was sponsored by uh, Debris Synthesis. So it was a mechanical study in human menisci, which I think is uh, important because a lot of studies use porcine menisci, which are significantly superior uh, mechanically, and therefore, um, I think some of the data is, is questionable as a consequence and how relevant it is to human uh, practice. So this is a standard uh, biomechanical model creating, creating a longitudinal uh, tear and then this is fixed by a single uh, device and then uh, cycled and distracted. Um, in this study there were six uh, groups Group one was a vertical mattress suture with uh, orthocord representing an inside out. Uh, true span was group two and three with the different uh, variations, peak and uh, PLGA anchors. 
Group four was the Arthrex uh, meniscal cinch. Group five was the Striker Air. And group six was the Fast uh, TFX 360. Samples were cycled 200 times and then uh, destructively uh, loaded. So the results, so the mean displacement uh, was 2.1 uh, millimeters post uh, 200 uh, cycles for the meniscal uh, cinch, 1.5 millimeters for true span, 1.4 for the fast fix, 1.1 uh, for orthocord, and 1.1 for the striker air. Uh, Consequently, the most uh, stiff implant was the, or stiff repair was the uh, striker air. With the least stiff implant was the uh, meniscus uh, cinch. In terms of uh, load to uh, failure, the orthocord was the highest with uh, 95.8 newtons. The true span uh, devices were not too far behind at 84 and 87 newtons respectively. The lowest uh, load to failure was with the meniscal cinch at 48 newtons. And then the uh, fast uh, fix and the strike air were roughly the same at uh, 68 and uh, 72 newtons. In terms of mechanism of failure, the meniscal cinch, strike air, and fast fix fail by anchor pull out from the rim, so the uh, peak box pulled out, uh, whereas the orthocord and the true span devices failed by suture pull out through the uh, meniscus. Uh, so, so if we look at those mechanisms of uh, failure, so anchor pull out from the rim. So this is also associated with uh, increased deployment uh, failure, uh, particularly in individuals where the meniscus rim is uh, deficient uh, as a consequence of significant meniscectomy. As a consequence, uh, if this occurs post repair, then you can get intraarticular migration of the uh, anchors, which then potentially could cause a chondral abrasion. And this may be one advantage of the all suture uh, devices. They may uh, cause less uh, damage if they do migrate. Other mechanisms of failure are suture pullout. So this is suture pullout through the meniscus or cut through the meniscus and associated with uh, poor quality uh, meniscal uh, tissue. I think this is sometimes uh, occurs as well during um, tightening of the sliding knot, which is associated with most devices. I'm not aware of any device that has a uh, objective method of uh, tensioning their uh, device and I think this is a, a, a flaw because it's always difficult to know um, how tight that knot is and what tension you're actually placing on the repair. Cycle elongation is the third mechanism of failure. Um, so the fixation will uh, stretch out. Consequently, there will be a distraction at the repair site and uh, likely lead to a biological uh, failure. There is no independent uh, data looking at the oral suture devices, as far as I can uh, uh, determine. Uh, this is the Jugger Stitch by Biomet, and this is their industry uh, white paper uh, performed by the company themselves, comparing the performance of the device uh, versus FastFix. As you can see, both in human and uh, porcine, the uh, Jugger Stitch were performed uh, slightly better, but uh, there was no significant uh, difference is uh, statistically. Similarly, the uh, Arthrex uh, fiber stitch, this is the white paper by Arthrex, again, not independently validated. Uh, they compared their uh, uh, device against uh, FastFix and uh, Jugger stitch. Uh, so there was, again, no significant uh, difference in terms of ultimate load or cycle displacement. But interestingly, in this uh, study, the uh, Fast fix performed better than the uh, trigger stitch. One of the other complications that can be associated with uh, all inside repair is meniscal cyst formation. So, in this retrospective uh, study, comparing all inside using the fast fix versus a inside out technique of 102 minutes guy with four year follow up, mean patient age of 21. Meniscal cysts occurred in 13.7% uh, of the study population and two uh, consequently went on to have a uh, cystectomy. If you look at the incidence uh, in between the two techniques, it was significantly higher in the all inside group. So that was 40%. 
compared to the inside out group, uh, which was 1.7%, or a combined technique group of 8.3%. Uh, medial meniscus, all inside repair, and concomitant ACL were associated with uh, cyst formation. So which suture configuration uh, should you use in order to improve your biomechanics? In this study, they uh, compared, uh, again, by the same uh, methodology as uh, earlier, um, longitudinal uh, tears fixed with a single or double vertical loop suture. So the single is a sort of full radius uh, suture in the blue, and then the double is, or, uh, is otherwise known as a stacked uh, suture with a, uh, two separate sutures, one on the superior surface, one on the inferior surf surface. This is performing 22 intact um, lateral menisci uh, from uh, TKR patients. So the single uh, vertical loop versus the double, there was no significant differences in the ultimate load to failure. However, at the end of 500 cycles, there was less displacement in the stacked sutures versus the single suture. So six mil versus nine mil. In terms of a study relating to all inside exclusively, um, this study using uh, the uh, FASFIX in poor side menisci. So again, you have to remember that that is uh, superior strength to the human. Uh, the horizontal suture showed significantly lower ultimate uh, failure load than the vertical suture. And then when they looked at the vertical sutures and different configurations, the stack suture, as in the last study, one on the superior, one on the inferior surface, was superior to the double suture, which is uh, in uh, B here. That was two vertical sutures placed on the superior surface, which was then superior to a single uh, suture, which is a vertical suture placed, a single vertical suture placed on the superior surface. Uh, suture breakage in, in this study was the most common mechanism of failure, um, and, and that represents the quality of the menisci in uh, the porcine uh, animal model. So in terms of suture configuration, you want a stack suture uh, uh, configuration, one on the superior surface, one on the inferior surface in vertical fashion, and avoid horizontal uh, mattress sutures if possible. In terms of then fixation uh, points, um, there's this clinical study which investigated meniscal repair in adolescent uh, knees. So 115 out of 175 were followed up with uh, patients younger than 18 years, mean follow up 41 months, uh, 91 out of the 115. So approximately 80% had concomitant uh, ACL. They had excellent uh, outcomes in terms of clinical scores with a 13% meniscus failure rate. What they did notice that there was increased risk of repair failure associated with low number of fixation sites. So when they looked at the group that had a failure, the mean uh, fixation point was 1.7 uh, devices versus uh, 2.97 devices used in the successful uh, meniscus uh, group. So multiple fixation points can improve your clinical outcomes. So in conclusion, so no one device has been shown to offer superior clinical results. A double vertical or stacked uh, uh, sutures, one on the superior, one on the inferior surface, has uh, shown to be superior with multiple fixation points uh, demonstrating improved clinical results. And uh, the advice is around five millimeters uh, plus apart in terms of your device spacing. Um, meniscus quality and repair technique are most likely predictive mechanical properties of the repair uh, construct. And therefore, really, which device you use is probably uh, the least important factor. And um, my advice would be to choose a device with active deployment in order uh, to prevent uh, deployment uh, failure uh, as the, the cost of these implants are not uh, cheap. Um, not tension is unknown, but and that is the same with all uh, devices and is very subjective and based on experience. Um, but ultimately, use a device that works most consistently in your, hand, your hands 
Um, in this way, you can minimize waste uh, and concentrate more on optimizing the repair construct with uh, the appropriate uh, suture configuration and the appropriate number of devices based on the test size. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I hope you'll all agree that this is a very comprehensive overview of the all inside repair devices and what devices they are and the scientific studies behind them. Our next speaker uh, to talk about the Fast T Fix 360 is Mr. Paul Tricker. Uh, Paul is a consultant knee surgeon at Ashford and St. Peter's NHS Trust, the Surrey Orthopedic Clinic, and the Sean Clinic in done. London. He trained through the St. George's Hospital rotation and finished up with fellowship in Sydney. He is going to talk, as I mentioned, about the Fast T Fix 360 device. Uh, thanks, Paul. Over to you. Hi. Can you see my screen, screen Amit? Can you all see it? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the meniscal repair with the FastFix 360 by Smith & Nephew. Um, I think this is important. Whichever device you use, or whichever technique you use, do no harm. Um, a badly performed meniscal repair is worse than a, um, a meniscectomy. So, sorry, my approach to meniscal repair is to prepare the tear, always do some kind of biological stimulation to make sure you reduce the tear accurately. And I think every speaker here will not only use one, one technique, um, I think everyone here will use inside out and a combination of inside out and outside in and all inside devices. Don't be scared to create extra portals or create some space on the medial side by uh, pie, cr pie crusting the MCL to avoid damage to the, to the condyles and protect your repairs. So I use this device, which is the uh, FastFix 360. It's got a very small needle. I think it's the smallest on the market, 17 gauge. It's got a, a number of options in terms of angulation, whether they're straight, curved or reverse curved. And it's got a 16 degree bend potentially. Um, but going back to the biological stimulation, make sure you get some blood. The best way to get some blood is to either do an ACL reconstruction or a combination of trephining, rasping, and I use, stimulate um, some marrow with a microfracture at the end of the procedure as well. This video, some of you guys may have seen before, it just uses a trephination needle and a lateral meniscus. Um, it's a cleavage component, a tear. Um, you want to try and preserve the lateral joint, but it just shows if you release the tourniquet and you've got some blood supply, and this is a fast fix 360 going in, you can repair tears that once weren't repairable. It's very important to preserve as much lateral meniscus as you can. Okay, so this is their slide, Smith and Nephew. It's easy, it's fast, and it's proven. Um, I think all the other devices that will be discussed are, are benchmarked against this, the FastFix. Um, I add this one, which is safe, and that's why I use it as well. So let's go through some examples. It's got easy deployment. You can truly do the 360 IV one hand. Whichever way your hand is positioned, you can deploy actively the FastFix. It's not a gun, so it's not dependent on your your position. It's got three angles, as we've discussed, and it's got the narrowest profile of the shaft, meaning when you're going under the uh, posterior condyles, you're going to minimize damage. So this is an example um, of a, probably a, a white, white tear actually on the, just in front of the popliteus so on the lateral side of using a rasp here, um, just to, to stimulate some bleeding if possible. And I'm going to show you, it's not the, my best one on purpose, but it's a vertical mattress using a FastFix 360. And it's just becoming familiar with these devices. So you can, oh, sorry, guys. Hopefully it went slow. The pictures on the right can demonstrate how the, 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 the implants are deployed on the other side of the capsule. So yeah, vertical mattress, if you can. And the reason for showing this video is often the meniscus will pucker up and therefore a combination of femoral side and then tibial side sutures will allow a more accurate um, 
meniscus repair. And it's also very important, I'm sure some of the guys will touch on this, about tensioning and making sure you don't overly tension these meniscal repairs to um, allow extrusion. So this is just a, a femoral and tibial side to show how you reduce the puckering. And then we're going to micro fracture the notch, as discussed. It's proven the Fastfix uh, 360 it has got the smallest implants, it has got the smallest hole in the meniscus. This is important when you are doing meniscal repair, and particularly when you're starting out and, and these devices fail, you can see the hole left in the meniscus. It's also got the uh, biggest, longest heritage, it's got a 20 year history and the highest number of papers and all the other implant companies that we'll be discussing today benchmark against the FASFIX. Again, their results, all the papers, including the Barber study that Martin Snow was discussing, that all have industry sponsorship. So getting true independent data is difficult. The meta-analysis of the FASFIX shows 86% success in all outcomes, be it symptoms, MRI, second look or reoperation rates with increased Lysheim scores, increased Tegna scores, and increased IKDC scores. It's cost-effective compared, compared with partial meniscectomy. Just one more video here, which is going to just show a tibial side um, tear, again on the lateral side, again vertical mattress, but using the reverse curve is good here for the tibial side tears, and having that option is useful. So again, vertical mattress after preparation, And it allows that meniscus to sit down. Okay, so we are doing more and more complex tears. This is a 14 year old girl who's 18 months after a lateral meniscal repair. Okay, it was previously discoid, and this is the tear. So she's had her previous fast fix repair performed by myself. And if I had inside out needles, maybe I'd have done it differently, or the Nova stitch, or those kind of techniques may have been an option here but I wasn't prepared to go to the rim in a lateral meniscus of a 14 year old. So I removed the devices and I tried to repair it again. So again, tacking the two ends or the multiple ends here with Vaspix combination of vertical and horizontal mattress sutures. Now this isn't a good looking meniscus, but we, maybe we can discuss this as a panel, what, what other people would do in a 14 year old girl. But I had the advantage that I knew I was going to come back and do an ACL on her. So I thought I had nothing to lose at this point. So I'll just let this finish. So again, you'll see it's, it's, it's not a great looking meniscus, but it would have gone to the popliteus. This is the follow up video. There's the loose ACL. And this is six weeks after, um, after the repair. This is a redo repair. And the, the, the only purpose of this video is to show that impossible tears have got a chance of healing. That's at six weeks in an unstable knee, but braced. Okay, so ramps, ramp tears are at the back here of the medial side, posterior medial, and they are present more times than you expect in an ACL. Uh, this is a recent paper which shows a meniscal, um, a ramp tear on the posterior medial side fixed with a, a femoral side is fast fix and you can see the closure of the, de um, the defect. This is, a, I think it's a, a Japanese paper which shows the use of a fast fix to repair by going tibial side to allow um, fixation. If you curve your device up and then down or down and then up, you can close this uh, ramp lesion. Apologies for the picture quality, but this just shows you an example of a ramp tear fixed with fast fix. Again, from the front, it's not clearly visible. There's quite a low ramp tear at the back here through the Gilchrist view, which you can probe. And just to demonstrate the point, if you put a fast fix above, uh, sorry, I just stood rasping the tear. If you put a fast fix above, on the femoral side, they, they will often miss the ramp lesion. So 
make sure you visualize this just demonstrates that you are going to miss it with this with this fast fix device and then using a reverse curved underneath the meniscus now you know the tear it's more visible obviously you can close the defect So we need to be careful with these devices at the back of the knee on the ipsilateral side. So this is just one device and it just shows that the defect is closed there. Okay, so everyone's seen this picture before. When you're at the back of the knee on the ipsilateral side, you need to be careful. You need to know your deployment length of these devices beyond the capsule. Okay, so safety. It's the smallest implant. It's got the smallest needle shaft. But this deployment length behind the capsule is important. So if you set your gauge at 14 millimeters on a fast, fast fix, you know that that blunt on, this, on the Smith & Nephew device goes another 1.2 millimeters. Some of these other devices deploy with sharp ends several millimeters beyond that. So we need to just be careful when you're doing it on the ipsilateral side. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Any questions? Thanks, Paul, for that excellent uh, demonstration of the fast TPIX device. And uh, it has brought up a lot of questions that can be answered uh, later on. Uh, we now move on to Mr. Neil Jain, who is a consultant knee surgeon at the Benign Acute Hospitals NHS Trust. He is a founder of UK Sports Medicine. He trained in Southampton and finished up its fellowship in Canada. Neil is going to talk to us about the fiber stitch and the zone navigator device. Uh, Neil, if you're ready, you can start your presentation now. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Amit. Thanks for the kind words of introduction. I'll uh, see if we can share this. Sorry, I'm it. I think I'm just having a little uh, technical problem here. I mean, I've, it looks like I've got to leave the meeting and rejoin to share. I'll just do that. Okay. Apologies. I we just wait to see why Neil gets ready to sort that out. I, uh, uh, could we go with David if Neil's not ready? David, are you We're okay. coming through the dining room. Uh, so we'll start with David Hollingers. David is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Great Western Hospital in Swindon. And his practice focuses on joint preserving surgery of the knee and hip in adolescent and young adults. Meniscal repair and transplantation is a significant part of his uh, practice. Uh, David is going to talk to us about his experience on the Jugger Stitch device. Uh, thanks, David, uh, for stepping in early, and we'll get back to Neil after this. Over to you, David. Uh, Amit, thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm from Wilkins Swindon, and I'm going to talk about the Jugger Stitch. <laughs> So, uh, do you have um, uh, research support for another device from Simba Biomet, um, but it's unrelated to this talk, and I have no financial disclosures in regard to uh, Chugger Stitch. Um, this is a different way of, of securing the meniscal suture as opposed to the devices using rigid pitons. So, essentially, using a Chinese finger trap mechanism um, with a a unique weave of a single strand of, uh, of polyethylene that goes through itself twice in opposite directions. And, into, and this gives you a single suture that then is able to self-tighten and hold its tension. Because you're getting this 
cinch or finger trap mechanism as the tension increases in the device, so does the compressive forces. So slippage and elongation should be markedly less than using a knotted technology, or well, that's the theoretical um, aim. It's been fairly recently launched, and it's a sort of marrying together of the existing and long-standing zip loop technology with the cinch technology, with the soft tissue anchors that have been used as uh, bone anchors for some time. So it's bringing these technologies together, gave the jugger stitch device, which we can see below. Um, come to straight and upward curved needles. There isn't a reverse curved needle, um, and we'll talk about ways um, but that probably doesn't have an influence on your on your practice. And because of the ergonomic shake of the handle, you can see again, you can deploy the device in any position. So you do get a 360 experience. Um, David, your slides are not progressing. You're still not sharing? I'm sharing now. Oh, let's try. Better? Yeah. Sorry about that's, that. That's better. So as we said, um, this was a marrying together of the juggernaut anchors with the zip loop technology. So two existing technologies brought together to give you the jugger stitch device. And we can see that the deployment is through firing the black trigger. We've got a depth limiter, which obviously important in knowing where you are around the posterior capsule of the knee. Slightly larger diameter needle than some of the other devices, but that's reflected in the fact that you are deploying a larger implant, um, which has probably got a green note, and therefore, hopefully, a greater pull out strength. This is what the implant looks like. We're looking at two, five, um, number five uh, anchors out of the polyethylene suture, and then two colored strands. There's a white and a blue and white strand, and we'll see how that suture differentiation will be important when we come to deploying the device. But there's no hard materials here. So if you ever get implant migration, unlike with a hard piton, your risk of chondral damage is going to be significantly reduced because it's only ever suture material you're going to end up with in the knee. And here we can see the device deployed both uh, in a schematic and in a uh, porcine model. Um, and you can see how it sits quite nicely. Uh, the white paper that um, Martin very kindly discussed did look at a comparison between fast fix and jug stitch. Numbers were small. Um, and I think, interestingly, the failures in the jug stitch group were often displacement or elongation of the meniscus relative to the clamp attaching it to the test rig. But there were no actual pullouts of the device in the failures of the jug stitch, either in cadaveric tissue or poor sign tissue. And I think the authors commented on the quality of the cadaveric tissue. Numbers are small, and I think the differences are not necessarily significant. They certainly show a non-inferiority between the devices and a more long-standing device. So how are we using it? These pictures are taken from uh, Mark Miller's paper, encouraging people to think about pie crusting the MCL. I don't think you need this much room, but certainly you need more room than you have on the left to avoid the risk of chondral damage. Um, and anyone who's not familiar with this technique, I would commend it to you. I think you've got to warn patients they're going to be sore for three or four weeks afterwards on the medial side. Um, but I think it does both make the repair technically more straightforward to do and um, reduces your risk of irreversible chondral damage. Um, Paul's very kindly talked about using accessory portals and looking at what you can get at from your medial portal or whether you need to move your scape to the medial side and potentially even make a low lateral portal to access the posterior or the lateral meniscus. So it's all about having a straight shot um, and you can practice that with a probe or a needle to be certain that you can put the device in in the manner you wish to. In terms of what we're doing, again, rasping the tissue, preparing the tissue is really important, both in the meniscus itself to remove any uh, fibrin from the surfaces, but also this pericapsular rasping to create a vascular response in the area to get a biological repair. And then we need to plan where we're going to put our anchors um, and somewhere between five to one centimetre, five millimetre to ten millimetre spacing. Um, but really enough anchors that you feel that the tear is stable. I would always use a stacked technique and I think that's both helpful biomechanically but also if you only put anchors on the superior surface of the meniscus by tensioning the superior surface you will distract the inferior surface the actual contact area of the meniscus in a vertical pattern tear will be dramatically reduced I suppose and therefore your chance of biological repair I think is reduced 
And obviously these implants will all fail ultimately if you don't achieve a biological repair first. Uh, anchor insertion is very similar to most all inside devices. So penetrations, the tissues, um, using the depth penetration to guide you, using that feel as you pop through the capsule. And the aim is just to deploy the, the implant just beyond the meniscal capsule junction, and then having deployed the implant, return the black lever so that the deployment mechanism is within the gun and then remove the gun and, and make your next pass. Um, you want to work towards the scope. So this often within the knee, particularly when we have more than one suture in place, you'll see in a later case, visualizing your where you want to put your suture can be difficult. So by working towards the scape can make your life easier. You can see here deployment, just a simple push of the finger, and then it naturally springs back. So you can again do this all one handed um, and comfortably move the, the handle in your, in your hand. When it comes to tensioning, we've got a white and a blue and white strand. And one of the advantages of this implant is the ability to tension the two loops independently of another. And I've used, the, I've used other all inside devices. And sometimes you need to put a hook in to act as a pulley because one strand is not tightening and you will over tighten the construct by pulling on the single strand. So here you can strip pull on eat the first blue and white strand to seat that first implant and tighten the first loop of your construct. And then you can have full control over the tension of the second loop without having to put in further instruments into the knee to act as a pulley system. So once we've tensioned our blue and white stripe, we then are going to go on, see we've sat the anchor here and we know it's sat, you can see we're there, but we've, we haven't put any tension on the second strand yet. So we still haven't committed to the final tension in the structure. And then we pull on the white strand and we can adjust the tension we want. And there we can see the first strand tightened, second strand tightening down. You've got full control over this. And again, this would benefit from a stacked construct and that would bring the meniscus back to a more normal shape by balancing it with an inferior suture. So you don't want to over tension this. I think definitely that's a real risk and over tensioning puts you at risk of suture cut through, through the tissues. You're merely opposing the tissue rather than trying to strangulate it. And then having deployed your anchor, you cut your, uh, your, your suture. Generally speaking, the up curve is going to work well on the medial side for those uh, posterior horn tears. And then the straight may be more effective on the lateral side, but the curve can be used in this region too. Um, much like Paul discussed, I think you have to have the whole armamentarium from you know all inside to um, inside out, outside in, and you know various push and grab uh, devices to facilitate doing maybe an all inside suture base repair. So there are a whole load of skills that are helpful to have that allow you to confidently place sutures in all parts of the meniscus. Um, just thought we'd finish with the case. So this is an ACL deficient knee, um, no tourniquet. I think, you know, you can do an awful lot of ligament work without a tourniquet. And all I've done here is I've put uh, adrenaline in the first irrigation bag. I've put local anesthetic and adrenaline in the knee prior to starting the case. And I, I, I don't use a, a tourniquet for any of my ligament work. Um, and it does mean that pressure of time is not there. Because I think these cases can be more time consuming than often we anticipate. And I think this is one of the more technically demanding procedures that we do. So ACL deficient knee and the subluxation has caused posterior horn tear. It's almost complete on the top. You can see how it's about to become, progress into a full um, longitude uh, vertical tear, but the major tear component is underneath. It's quite more, more extensive than would appear from the surface. And I think this merits repair both in terms of improving stability from the lateral meniscus as a stabiliser of the knee to the pivot, but also in terms of repairing the meniscus itself for its chondroprotective surfaces. So we put the first anchor in, and we're going down to underneath here, and we can see we've got a nice view through the clear sheath of the anchor being deployed. So we can see that what we're doing. And I put this anchor in, so here I've accessed from the medial portal. I've now swapped, swapped the scope over, and I've come from the lateral side, and again, the lack of the reverse curved implant doesn't cause a problem getting access to the inferior margin of the meniscus. And we're putting that second suture in. I haven't tensioned the first suture because that will close the meniscus down and prevent me having access. And now I'm starting to tension the first suture and we'll see this will just snug down. And you see how the meniscus is snugging down. If I hadn't put my 
second implant in, access would have been less free. So I've tensioned the second one, and there we've got a nice, fairly sound repair. We can see the devices underneath that safely on the capsule, really. So I think this has some benefits in terms of the lack of rigid pitons um, in potentially a stronger construct. Um, and I think it's straightforward and easy to, to deploy, but I, I would very much echo uh, Martin's comment that I think you need to get familiar with the device. Um, and there is a learning curve to, I think, all of all sports medicine devices and to go forward with something you feel comfortable with. Thank you very much. Thank you, David for that excellent uh, presentation. And it seems advantage to see a clear cannula uh, at this time uh, to see what the devices is going through. Uh, we'll just see if Neil is ready to go ahead with his uh, presentation. Yeah, it looks more promising this time. Looks good. There we go. Can, can yeah. everyone see that okay? Brilliant. All right, well, great. Well, thanks, thanks, Sammy. Apologies for uh, <laughs> the technical problems, I suppose. Uh, my name's Neil Jane. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Manchester in the UK, and I'm going to talk about the fibre stitch from Arthrex. Uh, so where to start? Well, I guess we start at the beginning. Big thank you to BIOS for the invitation, and a big thank you to this man. Speaking of beginnings, he was the founding president of BIOS many years ago, not only a mentor, a friend, and if he dedicated himself to golf 55 years ago, the way he did to shoulder surgery, I'm sure he'd be a master of that. Very appropriate this weekend. He celebrated a birthday this week, so many happy returns, Madhusab. Smashing. So I'm going to talk a bit about the Arthrex portfolio, uh, my previous experience with meniscal repairs, and then the experience that I've had and what led me to change to use the fiber stitch. I'll offer some top tips for the fibre stitch itself and then a little summary at the end. I think we've had a, an excellent overview already about meniscal repair, so I'll focus a bit more on the implant itself. And speaking of the portfolio, essentially there's this fibre stitch all inside, all suture device, along with the zone navigator, which is more the inside out device. Now, a picture's worth a thousand words, a video must be worth a bit more than that, so Here's an animation showing a standard uh, longitudinal meniscal tear. Here's the needle, the depth we can adjust. It comes loaded at 20 millimeters, but can be adjusted. And this is the handle with the uh, dial on it that we can rotate with our thumb. And as we insert the needle, we pull it all the way back here or feel a click and then push it all the way forward with our thumb, feel or hear a click again. And that deploys that first all suture anchor. And as you can see, very similar to the previous speaker, uh, the all suture anchor allows a, a broad, low profile compression against the capsule. Now, once that's been passed twice, we then are left with a loop and a strand on the outside. And quite simply, we can take the uh, arthroscopic um, hook probe, pull on the loop to set the first suture and then retension the second suture and then finally push it down with the um, pusher cutter, which is both a pusher and a cutter, and we end up with this beautiful meniscal repair, if only it was like that every time. <laughs> now, the zone navigator, to touch on that as well, this comes with a handle and three additional pieces that we can link to the handle. This is the inserter device here at the top with two needles, which are quite flat needles, along with a flattened suture tape rather than suture itself. And how that goes into the knee. So we can see here's one's been passed already. Here's the needle through the cannula. And watch the thumb here. It's simply just pushing forward this device to continually relay and load the needle through the meniscus and then through the capsule until it's retrieved on the other side. And then as you tension it, as you pull down, you can press on the, on the radial tear as well as you tie the suture. And then ultimately you can end up with this beautiful repair crossover type of suture from a previously uh, radial tear in the white zone that you may have excised. So really the focus is to try and use both things together if and when needed. Now, 
how did I come to be where I am now doing this? Like most people of, of my age, Fast Fix was the market leader. It was the most popular. It was the most traditional one we all used and probably we all learned from. So in the late 2000s, I started using it. And when I was a consultant, uh, I started using it as well. But unfortunately, I never really found it that easy to use in my hands. Personally, I found it quite difficult to tension, as has been alluded to already. It's, it's, it's very subjective, your tensioning. And I found it quite difficult to position as well. And that may just be me and my hands, really, more than anything else. We've mentioned some of the gun type um, de delivery devices that we used. Again, for me, I felt they were too cumbersome. I've got size seven, seven and a half hands, so I don't know if that led into it, but a bit of the rotation as well was quite difficult. This isn't just a pro Arthrex talk. Uh, even the Arthrex Municipal Cinch, when I tried that, the first generation was too cumbersome. And the second generation for me was a bit too flimsy and very difficult to deploy. So I ended up settling on, on the ConMed Sequent, actually. Ultimately, I've had some very good results with that after finding a way to really use it. It's a sequential all-inside device. But the caution I'd have with that is that it, it did have a very difficult learning curve. And in certain positions, because of the sequential nature of it, you, you would adjust the position of the, the shaft of the delivery device, which sometimes ended up with it being bent um, and you're having to uh, cut short the... Um, sequence of delivery of devices. So why did I switch? Why did I start using the Arthrex? Well, generally speaking, I do shoulders and knees uh, arthroscopy and a lot of soft tissue sports med work that way. And I'm very familiar with Arthrex and, the, and their approach and their portfolio elsewhere in the body. A common theme, I think, from them is the ease of use for surgeons to use their stuff. And uh, their mantra of helping surgeons treat their patients better has certainly helped me treat mine better over the last few years. As a result, there's many common themes along a lot of their devices across the shoulder and knee. And so I saw the appeal with the fibre stitch, given my experience with Arthrex products. So when it was first shown to me eight months ago as a fairly new device, uh, I looked at it and I thought, this looks quite easy to use and comprehend. It's a simple learning curve compared with uh, certainly some other devices I've used. It's a very reproducible type of technique. The mantra that I was just saying is something my registrars here in theatre all the time. All the way back, click. All the way forward, click. Replace, remove. All the way back, click. All the way forward, click. Pull out. Arthroscopic hook probe in the loop. Pull that, cinch that down nicely, and then push down with your suture cutter uh, and cut it nicely on the other side. In essence, I found it quite easy to position to tension, to cut, and it is, it is quite versatile. As has been touched on already, there's lots of different ways you can add to the versatility of a device. Um, and I believe Arthrex have recently, released, have recently released a curved range as well, which will help with the versatility uh, to what already is a versatile thing. So in the eight months I've been using it, I've only done 16 meniscal repairs, limited numbers essentially due to some of the issues with COVID uh, and some restrictions of lists. Uh, as you'd hope, no fa failures just yet uh, in my very early findings, but subjectively I felt a very secure repair has been achieved by using it. And I do wonder, as has been commented upon, if this all suture device, because it's broader and flatter, it can offer a, a greater degree of security as opposed to the uh, peak or PLA bars that were traditionally used. So here's, here's one case example of, of photos. Uh, this was a large bucket handle medial meniscus tear, which um, we were able to reduce quite successfully, but it was very unstable, as you can see here. Um, so sequentially, we placed a number of uh, fibre stitch sutures through the all inside device, and we're able to get a very nice and stable uh, repair and the patient's done very very well following it so a couple of top tips if we are going to use the fiber stitch I've touched on the portfolio available and this was something after doing that previous case I reflected on wouldn't it be nice with a very unstable uh, tear to have something to almost hold it in place while you put a few fiber stitches nice and simple just zipped it up that way and I think that's where the zone navigator can really help. 
By placing the zone navigator single stitch, you can hold the um, uh, meniscus back in place, reduce it, and then secure it with the fiber stitches. Now that meniscus, uh, that sorry, zone navigator suture could be um, permanent uh, or it could just be temporary as well. As has been touched on, it's always important to reverse your portals. That'll increase your um, access to areas that are inaccessible um, and it makes a versatile device even more versatile. Uh, it's already been touched on as well uh, by Paul, the previously unrepairable tear. I think we're now pushing the boundaries and I think uh, we're absolutely right to do so really, as long as we can be safe. And the zone navigator for me has helped me repair some radial and complex tears that previously I would have thought were not repairable. And finally, the thing about the portfolio, um, if you find something that works well in your hands, you can push the limits of it. You can repair things you couldn't repair previously. I think this portfolio is great, really. You've got the zone navigator, the fiber stitch and the scorpion. And once you become adept at all those type of things, it gives you the skill set for those who are interested in going on to do meniscal transplantation. So uh, in summary regarding the Arthrex fiber stitch, for me, it's very easy to use. There's a minimal learning curve associated with it. So in my experience, it's been the easiest one to learn how to use. It offers a secure fixation with an all suture anchor, thereby avoiding hopefully some of the chondral injury that can happen with failure of uh, plastic implants. And there's a versatility of options in its portfolio, which allows you to cover all the bases within this one portfolio. In essence, I think it will make the regular surgeon have better results because it's easier to use and their threshold for repair will drop and ultimately people will try and repair more menisci, will save more menisci and they'll be less excised. So all that's left for me to say is again, th thanks Amit, apologies again for the co confusion and my uh, internet and computer illiteracy. Um, using the fibre stitch is certainly much easier than me sharing a screen it would seem. If anyone wants to contact me, please do so on any of those methods and allow me this opportunity to invite all members of BIOS, anyone listening to Boster 2021, our virtual conference this year. Uh, it will have 30 hours or more of content available for three months. Uh, details on boster 2 aceuk or via Twitter. Uh, lots of great speakers, including some on this talk as well. So thanks to them as well. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil, for that excellent presentation. And I like your idea of having a mantra in theaters, uh, forward, backwards, uh, click, et cetera. I think that helps to keep you and your surgical uh, team uh, on the next steps of how to deploy. Can we have all the panelists, uh, the speakers on the screen, please? So we'll have Paul, uh, Neil, and David, please. Yeah, so Paul, if I can start a question with you. Uh, you have been using the 360 device uh, for a long time and that's supposed to be the gold standard. Anything that you would want to change in that device of how you use it? Yeah, so I did have a, a plug for the new FastFix Flex, which is out. Um, I accidentally deleted a slide while I was sticking it up, but you can bend it 80 degrees and the needle profile is smaller and it is really, really good. I got my hands on it two weeks ago. It's fantastic, actually. So I think that will um, really help, particularly in these tibial sided uh, repairs. Um, you're going to be a lot more, um, a lot more accessibility. So that, that, that's here now, actually. So. We've heard Martin's talk about the cyst formation. Anything that you have heard, cyst formation in your series? Me? Yeah, no, I don't, I've not noticed this. And I, I tend to do, if where, where possible, I tend to get follow up scans um, if cost and time allows on these patients. So we are now going to take a minute's silence. Uh, in honor of Prince Philip. So we'll take one minute silence now, please.
Uh, thank you for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So if you go back to uh, David and Neil regarding uh, the questions uh, for them, how easy was it to move from the peak implants to all suture ones? Neil, first question to you. Yeah, really easy, to be honest. I mean, if, if, if anything, I found it probably easier. I, I think it's not so much the implant, it was more the delivery device. And as I say, you get the visual, but also a very tactile feedback from this device, which I quite, I quite enjoyed and I quite liked. So, yeah, for me, it was very easy. I um, just want to say as well, the other thank you, I should say, is to David for filling in while I was being computer illiterate. So thanks. Thanks, mate. Thanks for that. Same Amit, question. May I, ask, Amit, may I ask a question? Yeah, of, of course. So uh, this question is for Paul. So like Paul, um, I'm a very avid um, 360 uh, fast T-fix user. Um, uh, could Paul tell us a little bit about um, the advantages of the reverse curve for engaging the undersurface of the meniscus? Because I, I find that really very helpful and very valuable. Martin. Hi, uh, thanks, Adil. Yeah, I, I did touch on it on my uh, talk, actually, a couple of times for the ramp lesions at the back in particular, and to allow any tibial-sided fixation, um, I find the reverse curve particularly useful. Yeah. It's just that in, in my experience, the value of the curve isn't access. It's much more that the curvature being, being away from the bevel means that you can engage the tip. If you use a regular curve on the underside, it skirts yeah. off and, and catching it is quite difficult. Correct. And sometimes an extra portal and having the, the probe on top of the meniscus to help as well is sometimes needed. But I completely agree with you. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, great talk. Wonderful. There are a couple of questions on the uh, Q&A. One is how different implants can be used to avoid a damage to neurovascular structures for the lateral meniscal repairs? David, if I can start off with you, any tips for that? Yeah, sure. So just answering that question, I think um, a lot of it is just thought around the anatomy. So they thought about where the main neurovascular bundle is. That's you're only really going to be at risk of of that with a straight shot for, uh, around the posterior, right at the posterior horn or posterior root of the lateral meniscus. And of course, the other structure is you know is the perineal nerves in play. Um, but you would have to have significant penetration beyond the capsular junction. So I think, for me, I think it's it's either use of use of the depth limiter or the feel. I think you definitely get a feel through the tissues, uh, and part of that is unfortunately learning curve with the device. So you get a feel as you're going through meniscus and capsule, and when you're you're sort of out the other side. So I think those would be my thoughts, really. So think just planning and so you're using all the visual cues in terms of, so you can't see the tip of the needle, but you can see the rest of the device. And that's what the depth limiter is there for. So that by referencing from that, you can visualize where the needle is in three dimensional space. Um, and again, you know, knee flexion. So you're un, you're less likely to be doing, unless you're a knee holder user, you're less likely to be using, doing lateral, compartment work with the knee and extension which significantly increases your risk the neurovascular bundle is uh, much further away as the knee flexes so that will put you in a safer position um so these are my, my thoughts on that and i think to answer your previous question about the transition for, between uh pitons to all sutures I, I don't think it's a particularly difficult transition I, I've used all the devices being discussed today at some point, and I think they all have some benefits. And it, it has an individual, you find what works best in your hands. Um, and I think you just want to have good support from industry with the introduction of the device to really talk you through how, how it's used. Um, and uh, and then just, just some time and some acceptance there will be a learning curve and working out what's going to be best in your hands. But the transition, I think, is not difficult. If you've used all inside devices, moving one from one to another is, uh, I, I found, to be a small step rather than a big step. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks for joining, Martin. Uh, you've shown that the stacked and sutures placements are much better uh, for repair. Some of these questions will be you know, repeated for the second discussion. But if you use lots of meniscal sutures, sometimes they form a little nodule 
on the medial side or the lateral side, and that can be painful. So the, is all suture better? Uh, I, I agree with David, really. I, I don't think it really matters between the two, to be honest. I, I think nodules are as much detail. I think they're the ones that tend to have little cysts associated with them. If you use an inside-out repair, I, I, I actually use the orthocord because that's partially absorbable to try and reduce that sort of knot stack. Um, but I, I think it's as much as much with all of them, really. Uh, I, I don't think it really matters which one you use. I think from that perspective, they're all the same. Thank you. Your talk really covered that. I think we'll take a break now as per time and then come back in five minutes for the second half of this webinar. And I thank all the speakers so far. And if you want to wait till the end, that would be great. Thank you.
Welcome back uh, to this BIOS educational webinar on meniscal repair devices. I think we've had an excellent informative first half and we look forward to the second half. Uh, maybe we could have made it an England v Wales match, but that's for another day. Uh, there have some, been a couple of questions on the uh, Q&A and we'll come to that in the discussion forum. I would like to welcome Mr. Ian McDermott, who is a consultant knee surgeon in full-time private practice now since 2007. Ian is the founder of the London Sports Orthopedic Practice, and he is also founder and immediate past president of the UK Biological Knee Society. Ian is going to share his thoughts and pearls of wisdom on the Striker Air Plus device for meniscal repair. Ian, over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amit. Um, thanks for asking me to talk and, you know, great to be part of a, a really good team of um, um, thoughtful knee surgeons with some good, good discussions. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the Striker Air and I'm actually going to talk about the Striker Air Plus and I'll try and screen share with you now if I can. I hope this will work. And hopefully you can see that. So the... I think I think one one thing to note about all of these devices is for those of us who are a little bit older, like me and well, definitely Dave Pemberton, um, the what we what we've seen is is a whole evolution of these devices. And what's slightly funny is how we all think we've got the best device, and then all of a sudden the company creates a new one. And the best best way to look at that, the best example is. Smith and Nephew, and they do do fantastic kit, undoubtedly. So they start off with the T-Fix, then it was the fast T-Fix, then it was the ultra fast T-Fix, then it was the, the fast fix 360. And now I think it was Paul mentioned that potentially there's going to be a, what did you call it, Paul? A flexi fast fix. So I think the important thing to remember is, you know, anything that we may think is best, it probably isn't best. It, it may just be the best we've got so far, and it may be the best in your or my hands. Um, and as everybody else has already said, the important thing is to have experiences in as many of these different devices as possible and also the different techniques. And what you've got to be is a portfolio knee surgeon um, where you've, you've got lots of different options available at your fingertips so you can pick the best one for the best situation you're confronted with. So I've been using the Striker Air for the last um, couple of years now, and Striker have just updated it, so, to, so it's now the Air Plus. And the basically, it took me quite a long time to remember or to get used to, to get into the swing of asking for an Air in theatre, because I kept on saying, right, can you get me a fast fix? Um, because it basically, I mean, obviously, for commercial reasons, you can't say it's a copy of a fast fix, but... A lot of these are, aren't they? And But it's a very, very good copy. And the reason that I moved over from the um, FastFix 360 to the Air, and now the Air Plus, is very specifically because it's a, a low profile device, small needle, good for access. But very, the main issue is it's bendable. So this is why it's very interesting to hear that Smith and Nephew are gonna bring out a um, fast fix flex. So this is a fast fix flex in everything apart from branding and name. So the advantage is you can bend the tip um, loads. Uh, I think I think it's probably, I, I've never purposely tried to see just how far I can bend it, but I'm pretty sure I can bend it to about 90 degrees and it still deploys without kinking. Um, and um, without getting jammed. And that's a massive, massive advantage. You can bend just the tip or you can bend it part way through. If you bend it further away from the tip, then you can get round. You can get round to the um, junction between the body and the an anterior horn. Um, so you can get really round quite very anteriorly. If you bend just the tip, then you can go underneath the back of the meniscus and you can go down. So hope this works but this is a little video and what we've got here is a a ramp lesion so this is somebody with an ACL tear and as soon as you see an ACL tear no matter what the, the MRI scan shows assume that there's a ramp lesion until proven otherwise because allegedly something like 17% of ACL tears have also got a ramp lesion and as has already been said by the other guys already, when you've got limited access, so there you can, sorry, you can feel a ramp lesion 
I mean, if the tip of your probe disappears underneath the meniscus, then, and it actually, let me pause. If it goes underneath the meniscus and goes into something, you know there's a tear. Even if you can't see the tear, you can feel the tear. And that's really, really important. And pie crusting should be a mandatory part of every soft tissue knee surgeon's uh, skill set or armamentarium. If you even think pie crust, do pie crust. Simple as that. So, yeah, percutaneous, get a, I use a white needle. And the bit that you need to really pie crust the most is, is a little bit more posterior than you may at first think. So it might well be, it might well be the posterior oblique ligament that we're pie crusting more than the actual um, MCL itself. And when you do that, then all of a sudden the medial compartment opens up and you've suddenly got this much, much better view. And then you can see your ramp lesion. Now, it's not just about seeing properly so you can diagnose things. It's about getting access so you can do stuff. So the way that I do a ramp lesion, um, I don't go back through a posterior medial portal like some of the Arthrex guys say with their, with their little lasso device, like a little aneurysm needle. I get my striker air and I bend the end and then you can tuck it underneath, rotate it so it's angled slightly upwards. Then you deploy. And then you put your neck suture underneath, but you angle downwards. And yes, it's a little bit fiddly, but that's why it's really important to get good access. So you've got one suture angling upwards, going through the actual substance of the meniscus, and you've got one going down. And then really importantly, as I think it was, I think it was Dave said, um, do not, do not tighten that suture. Right? The minute you tighten it, you've lost your access. So then get your next stitch in, and you want to put in as many stitches as are necessary, but without actually shredding the meniscus, remembering that you put in little holes in it. You could argue that those holes are actually good um, because you're actually trefining the meniscus. So, you know, more holes, the more, the more blood you're getting. But, um, you know, you don't want to put so many in that you actually make the meniscus friable and it starts to fall apart. So second stitch and then third stitch. So one going up, one going down. And then I swap portals. It's really important to swap portals quite, you know, whenever you feel you need to, make sure you've got the correct angle, um, not, just, not just the right view. So here's the last, the fourth stitch coming in, one going up, one going down. And then what you can do is sequ sequential tightening of all your sutures. So interesting, I still think actually the best uh, knot pusher and suture cutter is actually the Smith & Nephew one. So um, this is actually a Smith & Nephew not pusher cutter that I'm using here. So that was the first one, then the second one, tightened. And yeah, you do have to do that carefully. And every now and again, an anchor may pull out or it may cut through, in which case you might have to put an extra stitch in or just leave that one blank. Third one, and then swap portals come in from the other side. Here's the fourth one. And as you tighten these stitches, the meniscus kind of sits down. Remember, this is a specifically a ramp repair that we're doing. And if you want to, if you're still not quite 100% happy, then you can put some stitches on the on the superior, on the on the femoral surface as well. And this is obviously in conjunction with uh, doing an ACL reconstruction. So I do the meniscal repair first, and then the ACL reconstruction. Um, let me just stop that okay and i'm back i mean, i don't know if you've got time but my local striker rep um holly um edwards very kindly gave me a little model and gave me a striker air plus the air plus it, it's just a little bit more ergonomic than the air it's got a nice click when you actually deploy uh, i don't know how well this is going to show up on a video but do you want me to give it a, a try, Amit? Yeah? Okay. Now, if I go and spear this straight through my finger or thumb and end up bleeding, please will somebody call an ambulance for me because I'll probably faint because I don't like blood. So, there's your packet. 
there's your striker. Uh, very importantly, some of the meniscal repair devices are a little bit annoying. As you pull them out, they may kind of get damaged a little bit um, or caught up in some of the paper on the actual packaging. But this one's actually being packaged quite nicely. It's, it's quite ergonomic. So here's my striker Air Plus. And what you've got, you've got, you can use it doing this little handle at the top, or you can do it using this little handle down here. And you've got these various bits to grab onto, which is quite nice. You've got the sheath, the standard sheath, but you can actually push the sheath um, forwards or backwards. So you can actually have more or less needle showing and it's marked so you can actually see the little numbers. And then here's the important bit, right? And this is the bit that's fun. You can bend it. So if I want to do something that's quite anterior, I'll bend it down here and I'll bend it about there. Ow! Oh. <laughs> so um, that's to uh, what? What do you reckon? 70 degrees? So let's see if I could do it a bit more. 80 degrees. So there's my meniscal model. You get your thing, you push it through. It's a bit of a wiggle, twiddle it through. I won't get my finger in. Then pull back so it goes click and deploy. There's your first little anchor. Pull back and then the same again. Push through. Give it a little wiggle. Through it goes. Once you're through, pull back, click, so you know it's done. Push forward, done, and pull out. And then there's your repair. Then you pull it tight. And I actually, you can either just pull it and it'll tighten on its own, but I always find that a little bit nerve wracking. I think it's going to tear through. So I normally actually get a knot pusher and push on the knot at the same time as I'm putting but carefully. And then there's your stitch and then you can just cut it. So that's why I use the Striker Air. And I'm not saying it's better than anything else. I'm just saying it's really neat and really handy for going underneath things like that and over. So if you haven't tried it, it's, it's worth a try. It'd be interesting to see how similar the um, Smith & Nephew Fast Fix Flex might end up being. And then I can't wait to see what comes next. It'll be the Smith & Nephew Super Duper Fast Fix Flex 360 720. Technology, hey? Thanks, Ian. That was excellent talk. Typical non-controversial, as you do. That's great. And we'll come back to that in discussion. Uh, we move on to our next speaker, who's uh, Toby uh, Clifford. Uh, Toby is the UK DP synthesis sales specialist and also JNJ as well, I think. He's going to demonstrate the true span device. Uh, Toby, are you ready to go ahead? I believe so. If the technology is yeah. working, it's trying to Yeah, me. off you go. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting us this morning. <clears throat> I'd like to start off by saying, uh, first of all, apologies on behalf of J&J. Dr. Barber was very keen to, uh, to join us this morning, but unfortunately we fell foul of the, uh, the healthcare compliance department. And as a result, you're probably stuck with somebody you don't want to see at midday on a, on a Saturday, which is a sales representative. Um, I think uh, saying that would be amiss of me to pass any sort of clinical comment, uh, not being a clinician. And uh, what I want to do is try and fulfill the remit of the webinar and just give you an overview of our advice and by way of some light entertainment, uh, I'll also try a live demo. And uh, as with Mr. McDermott, if there's any blood, then please call 999. So true spans are, are offering the meniscal repa uh, repair device um, marketplace. And it's probably been out in the UK for probably somewhere approximating three to four years now. And I think it's probably fair to say that it's had limited exposure. Primarily, uh, when it was first released, we didn't have a dedicated MyTech sales force. And uh, we now have one. We've had one for about two years. But obviously, as a result of COVID, we've had uh, limited activity during that time. But hopefully, going forward, that's something that we'll rectify. Um, the true span is an evolution of, uh, of the OmniSpan device, which I'm sure you're familiar with. 
Uh, and the original design rationale when we were making it was really that, uh, first of all, it worked with a low misfire rate. Um, and secondly, that it was uh, new. So I don't think that, I think those are things we share in commonplace with, with our competitors. Um, we wanted to make sure it was usable in one hand. And uh, as a result of that, you've got automatic reloading of the, of the second implant into which I'll demonstrate to you in a moment. If I talk first of all about the implants themselves, if I just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, that would give you an, implant, uh, an idea of the implant configuration. Uh, the implants are low in their profile, 1.4 millimeter tool for the first implant, a 1.7 millimeter tool for the second implant. Um, when it was originally released, the implants were only available in peak, but as of probably two or three months ago here in the UK, we now also have it available on a PLGA material, which has got a 12 to 24 month uh, absorption rate, which hopefully would alleviate any concerns if there was any implant migration into the joint space. Um, when we talk about the suture itself, uh, the suture is uh, orthocord, which I'm also sure you're all uh, familiar with, with a 55% uh, partially reabsorbable um, uh, feature to it, uh, which should uh, take 12 months and hopefully alleviate concerns of irritation of the condyle as well. Just stop sharing. Now, if I can, I do say on television not to work with children and animals and I'm hoping I don't add true spam to that as well so that's the device itself when we look at the deployment mechanism as we said in the original de design rationale we wanted to make it simple to use and we, we hope we fulfilled that it does have a fairly stiff shaft certainly compared when, uh, when compared to the striker air plus that Mr McDermott was showing and it's not bendable, but it has got a certain amount of flex in it. Um, as a result of that, what we try and do to get to get to those more difficult to reach uh, repairs is it does come in a neutral degree or a zero degree angle. This is a 12 degree version, but it also comes in a 24 degree version as well. Uh, the needle itself is 1.7 millimeters in diameter. And as per other devices, you do have a depth stop. It comes preloaded at 18 millimeters. You can push it all the way forward to 10 as well. Right, having said that, I'm now trying to do a small demo. What I've tried to do there is replicate a small meniscal tear, and uh, we'll see how we go. So, introduce it into the joint space. What I'm going to do is go superior first of all, all the way through posteriorly. Let me just get that forward a bit actually. And it really is as simple as a squeeze until you get an audible click, release it all the way and we'll draw back into the joint space. You've got about six to nine millimeters of working space. Suture before you accidentally deploy the, um, you, you'll deploy the second uh, implant if you go any further. All the way through again. Squeeze to an audible click. Deploy. Withdraw out the joint space. As you're off cord suture. Now, ideally, it is designed not to be used with a probe, or you can use without a probe, but if you want to slide the pusher cutter down, you can as well. But if I just try and reduce that, what you'll find is one suture would uh, tighten up or reduce, first of all, with fairly minimal resistance. But then as that tightens up and we pull it further, we get a bit more resistance on the second one. That should, should reduce down nicely like that. Save the demo, I'll just do another quick one into the joint space through the back, squeeze, audible click, deploy, withdraw, back through the bottom, squeeze, click, release out of the joint, reduce. No tension on the first one, really, but then you do get increased resistance on the second one. Is it going to go? Yep, eventually she goes. It does come with a reusable uh, MyTech pusher cutter as opposed to a disposable one. But I don't have that on hand with me today. But I'm hoping it doesn't look too bad from a sales rep as opposed to a surgeon. Uh, and that just about concludes it, really. I'll take any questions if you have at the end.
but otherwise I hope that fulfills the remit of your uh, webinar. Thanks, Toby. Thanks for that. That was a good demonstration of the TrueSpan device. And like you mentioned, not many of us have seen it here uh, in the UK. And hopefully this webinar will allow it to other people to see it as well. Our next speaker is Adil Ajwed. Adil is a consultant specialist in knee surgeon and senior honorary clinical lecturer at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital. He is also honorary senior lecturer at University of Brighton and associate sports editor of the Knee Journal. Adil is going to share his experiences about the inside out technique. Can we start Adil's presentation, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be joining you today for this educational uh, uh, webinar. Um, and I'll be talking about inside out meniscal repair, an infinite solution and some novel uh, applications. Uh, my name is Adil Adrid, and I'm a consultant knee surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's and the Fortius Clinic in London. These are my disclosure of interests. In terms of meniscal repair techniques and strategies, we know uh, that there are three uh, core techniques, uh, namely inside, 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 outside, and outside, outside. Just to qu quickly touch upon these, um, inside, inside techniques uh, are very well evolved. There are a number of devices uh, available, um, uh, and these are uh, uh, very useful for managing middle third and posterior third tears. Uh, the technique is transportal, quick and secure. Um, uh, uh, although it can potentially uh, have um, a difficult learning curve, uh, there's always the potential risk of neurovascular injury and devices do have a cost profile. There is the outside outside te technique, which is uh, uh, indispensable for anterior third tears, but can also be used in middle third tears. This provides secure, cheap um, uh, and reliable uh, repair, uh, although it once again has somewhat of a learning curve and can be a little fiddly. And then we come to the inside out techniques. So inside out is, is uh, uh, best utilized for middle third and posterior third repairs, bearing in mind that for posterior third repairs, uh, accessory post-remedial and post um, uh, uh access is required to deliver the sutures uh, and tie the sutures over the capsule. Um, this uh, technique is uh, very cost effective, implant free, and provides a very high pull out strength and good biomechanics, um, and also lends itself to some specialist techniques or particular uh, types of meniscal lesion. In terms of inside out devices, uh, formerly I used to use a, a double needle system with double barrel, but I found that the double barrel was somewhat unnecessary as invariably I would move the barrel between deployments. Um, uh, I also found that the, the suture caliber was, was, was quite narrow, um, uh, being a 2-0 suture, uh, and did have a propensity to snap when being tensioned and, and tied down. And also, I was always a bit nervous about the low profile uh, predisposing uh, potentially to the suture cheese wiring or cutting through the tissue. So I now use the infinity uh, needle and zone specific system from ConMed. This utilizes a size two suture, uh, which has a much higher tensile strength um, uh, and, and a broader profile for load distribution through the tissue. It also comes in different colors and striations, which allows for easy differentiation of the sutures when tying down over the capsule without having to visualize intra-articularly to identify which sutures are which. Uh, the system also conveniently only comes with a single netonal needle, so there's only one sharp in circulation at any one time, and this reverts back to its original shape after each deployment. <laughs> the, the system comes with uh, the netonal needle, and here you can see uh, a single eyelet. Um, it comes with hi-fi suture in size two, and it comes with uh, single lumen uh, cannulas of various angles uh, and bevels. Uh, to quickly illustrate the, the, the use of the device, um, uh, the needle is uh, first passed through the meniscal tissue, um, having been threaded with uh, uh, a single hi-fi suture. This is passed through, 
giving us one end of the suture deployed. The needle is taken free, replaced into the cannula and rethreaded. And then the second end is passed independently. So there are a number of modes of application. Um, one can apply the sutures uh, vertically, uh, which is preferable, capturing uh, a good bite and a good volume of, of uh, meniscal tissue uh, and of hoop uh, collagen fibers with a good uh, 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 pullout strength. Uh, in more difficult to access areas, one can consider uh, transverse orientation. Sutures may be applied for total meniscal capture, such as uh, a bumper repair or a hail bay type repair, um, or potentially be applied partially to the superior or inferior surfaces uh, uh, as needed. And as we've already mentioned, this technique uh, can be used for percutaneously for middle third uh, suture application um, or via uh, a, an accessory posteromedial or posterolateral approach for posterior third repairs. The technique also lends itself to um, uh, more specific types of lesion, uh, in, in particular for the repair of radial tears or for the repair of irreducible or very difficult to reduce bucket handle tears. This is something that I'd like us to just look at uh, in particular. So for radial tears, um, our aim is to um, uh, build a ladder. And this is a reinforced horizontal repair um, with two vertical suture limbs. Uh, the construct that we aim to, to build uh, is this one. And we use two different suture colors so that we can differentiate between the sutures externally um, uh, and differentially tension these. So I, I would tension the uh, vertical limb green sutures first before tying down onto them with the transverse blue sutures. This is a short video illustrating the technique. And here we see a radial tear in the lateral meniscus um, uh, of a young sportsman who is experiencing both pain and mechanical symptoms. You can see that this is a very healthy compartment with intact chondral surfaces. Uh, the tear is prepared um, uh, and debrided. Uh, two vertical limbs have already been applied. Uh, these are our buttress vertical limbs. And we apply our horizontal limbs either side of these, abutting our vertical limbs such that our vertical limbs act as buttresses and help to splint and support uh, the tension through uh, our horizontal blue limbs. Once deployed, the differential sutures are easily identified by color difference externally and are tensioned green first and then blue second. So moving on, uh, looking at the management of difficult to reduce and irreducible bucket handle tears, um, the philosophy that, uh, that we try to use here is one of uh, slow progressive application of tension to allow tissue uh, reduction um, uh, uh, by applying tug sutures. So uh, very novel um, uh, recently in the news is uh, 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 has been the use of um, multiple tugboats to help um, uh, dislodge uh, a large freighter uh, ship in the Suez Canal. Um, and here we see the application of um, uh, tension and time to move a very difficult and relatively immovable object. So first of all, we need to uh, mobilize uh, our chronic irreducible tear. And often there can be adhesions at the posterior and anterior horn that require debridement and mobilization. Once that's been done, we apply two tug sutures, one at the junction of the posterior and middle third, um, and the other at the junction of the uh, middle and anterior thirds. Uh, we, we, it's very important to be really very patient and give the meniscus time to respond to the tension um, as long as 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, but gradually we see the tissue reduce um, uh, and we can achieve reductions of lesions that historically we would have deemed irreparable. Once again, here is a, a brief video and using um, the Infinity Hi-Fi zone-specific system, 
we apply a tug suture at the junction of the um, middle and posterior thirds, and we deploy a, a superior and inferior suture limb over this chronic deformed and tubularized meniscus. We take our suture loop uh, posteriorly and then apply some gentle traction to aid reduction. We can see here that we still need uh, some more tension and we need to apply some load more anteriorly. So we apply a second uh, tug suture at the junction of the middle and anterior thirds, deploying superiorly and then anteriorly. And as we tension this, we can see the meniscus gradually start to reduce. There's a small segment of everted meniscus in the middle third, but the application of a further inside out suture reduced that eversion, and we can see that the meniscus is indeed reduced. So to conclude, the key benefits of the infinity needle zone specific system are that it allows the use of size two suture, um, which has a high tensile strength and broad profile for load distribution. The suture comes in multiple colors, allowing for easy differentiation. And at any one time, you only have a single sharp in circulation. Um, there has certainly been a resurgence in the use of inside out sutures, uh, which are really very versatile. Uh, and I've certainly found them invaluable uh, for uh, repair of both radial tears and for the management and treatment of difficult to reduce and irreducible bucket handle tears. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to uh, case discussion and, and Q&A. Thank you, Adil, for that very informative talk and innovative uh, suture management. Uh, I found that when I do a bucket handle with an ACL reconstruction, if you leave the tuck sutures and do the femoral or the tibial tunnels, that gives enough time uh, for the elasticity to set in. Thank you. We come to the last speaker of the day, uh, Mr. David Pemberton. Uh, Pembo, uh, sorry, Mr. Pemberton is the orthopedic consultant at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital uh, for as long as anyone can remember. He is the founder member of Vale Healthcare, is closely associated with a number of rugby clubs and continues to play rugby at a veteran level, uh, acquiring a lot of injuries. He is going to share his experiences of meniscal repair over the years of his practice. Your slides should be up Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, my slides are going to come up there now, and I'm going to uh, take a, a leaf out of Mr. Jane's book and uh, also from Mr. McDermott. Very kind words. Thank you. I'll get back to you later on uh, regarding uh, my age. And I won't possibly attempt to screen share. I'll get someone else to change the slides for me, just like Boris Johnson manages to do so. And old is gold was the title offered to me by Amit. Uh, it's very kind of him. Um, I thought about changing it, but no, what do you really want? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I want is the next slide is the experience of what's happened in my generation of orthopedics, you know. Um, on the left there, that's me playing rugby uh, on fellowship at Adelaide University. And on the right was the last game at Vets level before uh, lockdown. And what's happened in between is I still play the game, but I don't, I don't play it the same as I used to. The game has changed a huge amount, and so has orthopedics. Next slide, please. And so Confucius uh, told us, oh, two and a half thousand years ago, the ways of gaining wisdom, and they haven't changed a huge amount, really. The reflection which we're all supposed to sit down and do, and we're even told to do it now in our appraisals, uh, is supposed to be the way that we are learning. Imitations, the way our boss used to do it, so he did it that way, so I'll do it. That's the easy way to do it. And then with all the experience, which comes somewhere in between the two. I think Confucius was ahead of his time, really, because if you look in his, uh, his left hand there, he's probably got one of the very earliest all inside long sutures uh, for repairing, and he's about to practice it. Next slide, please. So this is a, a long one, the original needles, uh, 12, 15 years ago now, um, all inside, which you bent according to what position you wanted it to be, and you put it in either freehand or through various jigs. And 
we've just heard over the last hour and a half various imitations of that technique which really haven't changed a huge amount uh, but they're now much sexier and prettier and a damn sight more expensive than they used to be next slide please okay so times change techniques change implants change and surgeons change as I get older through my rugby career, I get weaker, slower, less efficient. Hopefully in my orthopedic career, that is going the opposite direction. And somewhere in the middle, I managed to coordinate my, and combine my interest in rugby with my interest in orthopedics. I'll come back to Kevin Morgan later on. Next slide, please. So Confucian, Confucius was quite keen on uh, reflection. Uh, so those sutures on the left, the slide's a very old slide, that's uh, about 15 years old. Uh, and tell you what, doesn't look much different to what we've just been discussing for the last hour. And on the right there, there's a nice little dart, which seemed a very good idea at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, they're a good logical solution, they're nice easy to fix, you bang them in, squeeze this meniscus together, and a bit of biology in there, it was PLA. It stayed in position until your uh, meniscus had healed, and then you took it out and it resolved itself. Brilliant, magic. Uh, unfortunately, we know that's not quite the story. Next slide, please. So you learn by your experiences. You learn by other people's experiences. You learn by good experiences. You do that again. You learn by bad experiences. I'm not doing that again. And ideally, you try to learn from other people's mistakes, uh, the likes of myself, or I learn from other people's who taught me. You learn how to do things and you also learn from your bosses how not to do things. We just look at the example of where the ACL tunnel has changed in the last 35 years since I've been involved in orthopedics. Um, I was taught originally to put them in around the, over the top, not even try and do a femoral tunnel. tunnel. Um, well, it's fairly close to where you are uh, nowadays uh, and certainly closer than the so-called anatomic position, which we ended up in bottom right there which everyone would agree now is a bit too far forward. Uh, but the results of that, we were told by the great and the good of orthopedics, who shall remain nameless, that this is the way to go, until they looked closely at their results and found actually, even though it's nice and stable in the lab, our failure rate is higher. So let's go back to where we were. And what we've done on ACLs, and I've done ACLs, is gone back to putting them in pretty well where I used to do 35 years ago, because that works most of the time. Next slide, please. So the experience um, is the bitterest way to learn. I learn it the hard way. Uh, and I'll tell you what happened with Kevin, how I learned on that one later on. Next slide, please. Let's slow this down here. Pick your winners if you're gonna repair them. We've all discussed that already. You, uh, we've had some fantastic displays of really complex uh, meniscal tears, which have apparently had successful results from our speakers. Uh, and I agree with what Neil was saying, the younger the patient, give it a go, see if you can do, but you must warn your patients in advance that these, this is a, a difficult um, procedure with a high failure rate in the wrong patient. So pick your winners, young, fit, healthy patients, preferably with intact meniscal roots. Next one, please. And if you're going to repair them, pick a, a nice clean repair, preferably in the red, red zone, preferably in a young patient, and even do an ACL at the same time, and you will probably get, you'll give you the best chance of getting the best result for that. Uh, next one again, do some root repairs. Sorry about the quality of that, but we all know what a root tear looks like. Um, 25 years ago, we didn't know. We just ignored them because uh, it wasn't really relevant. We didn't really know about the true relevance of the radial tears and the loss of that hoop stress uh, phenomenon from the meniscus. So, uh, repairing roots now is a very appropriate thing to do. Next slide, please. And what's happened there with experience is those surgeons who were shoulder surgeons, I'm used to tying knots and grasping, grabbing tissues inside the knees, were the best at doing root repairs. And those of us like myself who wasn't a shoulder surgeon, struggled with them. And then some better kit has come along. That's uh, one of my latest ones, only done a couple of weeks ago. I thought I'd show you that because that's about the best bite I've ever had on a, on a root and a good result. So that's, that's where we can pull and um, expand on the, the wind of opportunity to repair these. And yeah, they do well if you get them done properly first time. Next slide, please. 
Um, avoid the losers. Older patients, complex posterior horn tears, three planes, bit of loss of uh, medial joint space. These are not going to do well. We know the meniscus is failing. We know the joint is failing. And don't kid yourself that putting a few sutures in there and even some very good sutures in there is going to change things. Next slide, please. We've heard some fantastic stories from the industry and from individuals here about the all inside. It's the Messiah. It was what we were all looking for. It cured all our problems. They were easy to use, quick to use, simple to use, a lot of fun. We're very privileged as orthopedic surgeons. We got some fantastic bits of kit to play with. Um, and you can get very nice looking repair. We've seen some demonstrations of beautiful repairs on bits of plastic and rubber uh, already. Um, we all know that's not quite the whole story though. Next slide, please. Which bit of a uh, kit you use, you make crazy money takes your choice. They've even got nice knots, tieable and cinchable and closable inside the joint for you. Uh, that's because the hardest thing of all this is to get that knot tied. So the companies have very nicely come up with ways of tying it for you, which we've all found fantastic. Next slide, please. We've also all been back into these knees to take out failed uh, implants. They're expensive. They're obviously often a bit weak, or they're, they're weak, see it appear to be weaker than the, the tissues require. There's a high failure rate with them. Even though the quoted figures there, 75, 80% success means one in five are failing. They're not always fun to use. They can be a complete pain, but taking the wrong knee. The, there's a high failure rate. And we can blame the implant for that. We don't blame ourselves for picking the wrong patient and doing the wrong operation. It's the implant fault that's failed. And the fast fix 15 to four ratio, uh, is a record in our local hospital by the senior knee surgeon, a little bit more senior than me, uh, who used 15 implants, 11 of which ended up on the floor, four ended up in the patient for the remainder of that procedure, and I think those four were removed at some stage not long afterwards as well. Next slide, please. That's over a thousand, nearly two thousand pounds of the kit on the floor. So when I first started doing these, the only option we had was uh, inside out with long needles. You could try outside in, but uh, that was a real faff because you had to tie knots inside the knee and I couldn't do that. So inside out was the way to start doing them with long needles. Then the jigs came along and then the guides and the various bits of kit, uh, sharpshooters and other devices that come around. They really are very nice for putting these needles in. And then what size an implant do you use? Do you use a braided one? Do you use as we've heard today? How do you protect the posterior horn? How do you protect the uh, structures at the back on the lateral side? But you can get a lovely repair. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So one of the things I was gonna flash through there is the, just go back that one, sorry, I've taken you two ahead there, um, is the so-called mobile lateral meniscus. Now in young adolescents, there is a mobile lateral meniscus, they're often dysplastic, they're often uh, grown up normally, the discal meniscus are rather mobile and they just tear. But in older patients, you don't suddenly have a mobile lateral meniscus appearing at the age of 20, 25. Those are torn and they're torn on either side of your popliteal hiatus and they don't show up on MRI scan. A bit like your ramp lesion. We didn't believe that they existed until we went looking for them. You know, we didn't believe ramp lesions were around. You know, Ian Bo uh, Steve Bollum was going across these about 20 odd years ago and uh, only recently said, oh yeah, they do exist after all, we'll start repairing them. So this torn lateral meniscus and the mobile meniscus is down to your clinical acumen and listening to the patient and describing what's going on rather than your MRI scan. Next slide, please. Someone's had a go at that one previously, that little suture in there. Looks all right, seems all right, intact meniscus. Next slide, please. You put a probe behind it as we've shown earlier on and that's mobile. Next slide, please. So use a bit of biology, freshen it up, make, get down to some bleeding bit, get some um, blood coming into it, put some inside out sutures into it, either side of popliteus, so the hand there. Next slide, please. Pull them down quite tightly and the next again, please. And you get a nice knot and squeeze it on. Looking good, but tell you what, I'm still not very happy with that. Next slide, please. I'll put an all inside there uh, and inside out there as well as belt and braces, make sure I'm happy. And on the left, that, go back one, sorry, 
I'm going too fast now for you. You see, I've puckered up a little bit and we've argued today about how tight to make these. Clearly, if it's too slack when you put it in, it's not going to work ever. So put it in the right tension. We don't know what the right tension is. If anything, I err on putting it a bit tight because I know the patient's going to be weight bearing on that uh, and it'll bed in. But if you over tighten them, yeah, sure, they'll cut out. Next one, please. And a bit of biology as well to try and release some of these uh, fancy humors which are supposed to make a difference to healing. Next slide, please. So where are we now then compared to what we were when I started 30 odd years ago? This is just one company uh, implants for the various options available. And every other company's got it. And there are a huge number of uh, different devices around. And I think uh, I would agree with uh, Ian that we need a, a spectrum. You need an armamentarium of these, you need your toolbox. And what's good in your hands will work for you and not necessarily for the next person. So it doesn't have to be one company either. Next slide, please. The biology is where we're really changing things. We can't change that, but we've got to try and create the environment for our meniscal repairs to work. We all know the blood supply is atrocious. It's in the red, red zone. Try and stimulate that. Try and add some growth factors into it. Try and put PRP into it. If anyone still uses that these days, 10 years ago, it was the, it was the Messiah. Put a snake oil, whatever you want. Next slide, please. So we're not really reinventing the wheel, but we're evolving the wheel into current practice. And we have forgotten biology in the past. You know, 30 years ago, didn't bother repairing meniscus because it wasn't worth it, take it out. Even when I started 25 years ago, you were pretty brave if you started repairing meniscus. And then 15 years ago, yeah, put the fancy all insides in there, they're brilliant. Then my root tears, because they're too difficult, leave them alone. Then we got a bit of biology on top of that. And now we're doing a bit of both. Tell you what, we're back where we were 25 years ago. Next slide, please. So back to Kevin Morgan. He is an international player for Wales, a outstanding young talent, and he ruptured his one cruciate as well as a meniscal tear when he was about 21. Or he did his ACL reconstruction and repaired his medial meniscus. Loved the ACL, fantastic early rehabilitation, meniscus retour. Had to have another operation, delayed his comeback. Two years later, he ruptured the other side. Worse injury, bigger medial meniscal tear, lateral root avulsion tear, and an ACL. We had a long discussion about it. He said, forget those menisci, um, take them out, just do the ACL. So we did. He played and won a grand slam for Wales six months later after an ACL reconstruction, which was my best. He, that was 15 years ago. He's had no problem with that knee ever since. Next slide, please. So you've got to deal with your outcomes expectations, which are your own expectations. What we're trying to do is protect this hyaline cartilage for the next uh, 20 years. We believe we're achieving that. Your patients want the knee they had 20 years ago. That ain't going to happen. You've got to deal with their expectations as well. And if you get it wrong, if you pick the, the wrong implant the wrong patient the wrong procedure the lawyers will be after you as well and they won't care whether you've got elongation of your suture fatigue of your suture pull out wrong implant they'll think your operation's gone wrong they don't care about the arrest they're after you so in the wise words of tim briggs get it right first time and if you do next slide please next you might be tim briggs giving you a big sloppy kiss on the cheek rather than me. So can you go back to slides off, please? Back to me, please. So slides off and back to me. Thank you. Uh, so thank Ian um, for his kind comments. Um, I've obviously been a bit cooler in my uh, studies because I haven't torn all my hair out just yet. But that's maybe because I just kept it covered with the appropriate wise old man's cover. And I'll happily take presentations and uh, discussions at this point. Thank you very much. Jeff Abadafi. Thank you very much, uh, Embo. That's an excellent. Can we get all the faculty spotlighted, please? Ian, if I can start with you. Uh, 
would you use two different companies' implants at the same time? Oh God, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the ultimate meniscal repair is actually called a meniscal transplant. And if you're doing a meniscal transplant, then you're doing two root repairs. You're doing, well, I, I do multiple inside sutures, um, tibial surface and femoral surface, as far around as you can towards the anterior horn. And then the anterior horn, I do either outside in or inside out. Um, so I, I tend to use striker for the airs, Smith and Nephew for the nut, the knot pusher. I use an Arthrex metal suture buttons. I use a Conmed inside out, um, so in specific cannulae. Um, I use Smith and Nephew outside in needles. Um, so I think that's a definite yes, definitely. absolutely. Oh, that's great. And I think that's what we need and to learn that we should be able to use as many devices as possible. Question to you, Adele. Uh, you've mentioned the percutaneous uh, fixations and also making incisions. Do you make large incisions? Uh, because I find that sometimes when the sutures are not colored, you tie the wrong ones sometimes. Sorry, I Amy, mean, is that a question for me, sir? Yes, I did, yeah. For but, anyway, incisions I did, I, I did for the, the inside beginning. Yeah. So, so um, generality within my practice, um, for posterior thirds, I use all inside devices. So I don't often have to do a sub-gastroc posterior medial posterior lateral dissection. Uh, uh, but uh, in instances where, where, where it, it may be needed, such as a meniscal transplant, I, I'd have no aversion to doing that. Um, in terms of the percutaneous suture retrieval uh, and suture tying for the middle thirds, um, uh, I will deploy all of my sutures first and then make a very small five millimeter incision, um, a blunt dissection uh, um, uh, in the fatty layer, and using an arthroscopy hook, retrieve all the sutures out of the small five millimeter incision, uh, being careful not to cut the sutures. Um, uh, and then because they're all color coded, I know which sutures relate to which part of the construct. Um, uh, and then I throw down some uh, stacked uh, 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 knots um, uh, cut that, cut that uh, with a very short tail <clears throat> and then allow that those stacked knots to fall back into the small incision. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, externally, it looks like a, a third arthroscopy portal uh, in, uh, at the medial joint line or lateral joint line, but it, it is effectively percutaneous. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, th please, please forgive me. The, the one thing I, just do, I do want to mention, just because I think it's really important, is that in my experience, often these patients can be in more pain than an ACL reconstruction. Um, and that's because the sutures around the capsule um, uh, can be really quite sore. So it is really important to infiltrate very generously around the joint line when you do these um, inside out sutures. Thank you, Adil. That was my next question because they are in a lot of pain. Uh, so I think infiltration is important. Uh, so, Pembo, what you've experience has gone back to full circle. What do you think is the future? Um, the, yeah, the future is, is not sticking to one particular implant, but that's come out now. And there was a uh, question earlier on from, from Atul Malik, who raised that, what, what age would you put this uh, and what type of tear would be the limit of what you're going to repair? Uh, and Ian's just said that the the ultimate repair is, you know, it's a piece completely of the dead tissue with no cells in it whatsoever. And we're putting those in there. So we're happy to repair those. So the younger the patient is and the more peripheral is, the more inclined you are to give it. But patient education is the answer uh, to let them know exactly what you're doing. You know, this, this meniscus is an essential structure and it's knackered. We are trying now to reverse a very difficult procedure. We usually get away with it, uh, but we might not. And that's education for them um, and the consent process and all the problems you have with legals at the moment. The real future, I think, is in biology, in getting these things to heal. It's a pretty inert bit of tissue, uh, encouraging it to regrow again. So with these growth factors and ways of doing it, creating this environment for it where it gives its best opportunity to heal. Well, now, with whichever humors it is, whichever we're releasing subchondral cells, PRP, clots, whatever it is, we, have, we haven't got there yet. 
but that is the future, I think. Biology, molecular biology. Maybe even Excellent. growing a living bit of your own meniscus in a pot built to your size, which you can then transplant as a bit of living tissue rather than this will transplant a bit of dead tissue. All that's going to happen, not in my lifetime and not even in Ian's lifetime, but in one of our lifetimes. Thanks, Prabhu. That's good. Uh, regarding the blood clots, I know we have discussed that because it's device. I can't get hold of a glass bowl or a glass syringe in the UK. It's just not there. So coming to biology, Martin, what do you think should we do apart from microfracture? And then I'll ask Ian whether his vivostat should be used for meniscal repairs. Uh, yeah, biology, I think there's lots of things you can do. Uh, but I think the issue is going to be what what can you get away with sort of cost effectively or, or cost wise because the problem is yeah you, you've already spent about a grand on your repair so um, and the reimbursement isn't there for much else so uh, for me I I actually take a, a, a trocar biopsy trocar needle I'll 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 put it up the intermedullary canal of the femur through the notch. I'll aspirate, uh, sort of eight to ten mils of bone marrow, uh, and then I'll use that. I've in sort of really younger patients. I've done uh, Thomas Piontiek's uh, um, plaster or bandage technique with a with a conroguide in you know in in sort of like children in, in an attempt to preserve that. Um, I, yeah, I agree. I think if you if you could get hold of a glass bowl, that would be you know, a cheapest uh, uh, stick to create your clot and, and put your fibrin in. Um, but yeah, I, I think the problem is, is that we we may find ourselves ironically going back to inside out uh, tech repairs in order then to afford what potential biologics are going to come along because you know, 250, 300 quid a, a pop for each repair like I say, it's probably more important to have the biology than to have the implant. So, um, yeah, I think we might go back to uh, back to the future, I suppose, like Pembo said, with regards to, to our, our implants in order to afford the biology, because, yeah, the biology is the important bit. Thanks, Martin. Can I, can I, can I just pose a, a converse yeah. argument? Um, I, think, I think sometimes we actually overplay the biology piece in so much as the knee environment wants to heal. So we all look for ramp lesions on acute MRI scans. And invariably, we find a lot less when we go in after prehab because often those lesions will heal. Um, uh, we often, uh, you know, we used to talk about white, white lesions being completely non-salvageable and just debride them. I, lesions I can say, heal. I, I would say actually the converse in, in that the biology of the knee is not to heal because you never see an ACL heal. You you, uh, no, no, you, you do. That does heal no, I, I disagree. The joint. I see ACLs. Not probably. That, I right. see convulsions that heal. If he moves yeah. swiftly on to Ian to ask him about his vivostat, I will come back to you, Adil. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think I think Adil and Martin have both got a point. So they shouldn't argue with each other. They're both both very nice guys, and they're and they're both very clever, and they're both right in different ways. Um, yes, yeah, some ACL tears can heal. Right, that's a different that's a different answer. Uh, sorry, a different subject, and it depends on your definition of tear and how bad the tear is. Um, but I I kind of as far as the meniscus is concerned, I take more of Martin's point of view, which I think your 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 default position is that is that the biology is against you. And I think it's partly due to the fact that you've got um, a poor blood supply. It's partly also the synovial fluid, right? So synovial fluid is not conducive to healing. It washes away any blood clots or any cells that are trying to heal across a gap. If there's a gap anywhere and the synovial fluid gets into it, it's gonna inhibit healing. Um, and also you, you talk about structures that have your entire body weight going through them, you know, more than body weight going through them. Um, so I think, I think the biology is, st is stacked against us in terms of cost. What Martin brought up is really important. Um, if you're working in the NHS and I don't know what the NHS tariff for an arthroscopy is now, but let's say it's, I don't know, I'm guessing 2000 pounds or something like that, um, or three. And then you've got some kind of, <laughs> annoying individual like me turning up and doing a, a bucket handle meniscal repair and the most stitches I've ever put 
in a meniscus is 15. And that was a, a bucket handled repair with an ACL reconstruction on a colleague's knee. Um, and if you think that these, you know, fast fix or in the anesthetic room, it takes half an hour to spin it down and you get five mils of fibrin glue with a high concentration of platelets. Now, I don't use it, I call it a biological glue. I don't use it as a glue. I'm not relying on its mechanical properties to, to glue a meniscus back together. I think in the future we may well get proper biological glues, but this is not it. I use it to cover over my repair because I really want to seal it. I want to stop the synovial fluid from getting into that repair interface. And also the platelets release growth factors over the course of the first seven days on a diminishing, diminishing graph. Um, and anything you can do to promote healing is really important. But I don't just do that. I also do what most of the other guys do, which is I use the, the needle from one of my meniscal repair devices um, once it's been deployed. It's a perfect needle for then trephining the, the meniscus and making it bleed. Um, and the other thing is, as everybody has already said, you know, if you microfracture the notch or if you're doing an ACR reconstruction, then that's even better. So I think the biology is really important. And the reason it's important to do everything you possibly can to try and get that meniscus to heal is that if you've done a meniscal repair, then it's nearly always in a young person who really kind of needs that meniscus. And if it fails, then you've put them through six weeks on crutches with a knee brace, six weeks of rehab, um, and then potentially a second operation that leaves them in a worse position. It's a really, really big deal for the patient if they have a meniscal repair fail. So I think there is a sound argument for doing everything reasonable and sensible and scientific that you can to try and get it to heal. Proving scientifically, statistically, proving what's A, effective, or B, cost-effective is a completely different kettle of fish and much, much more difficult. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. I didn't I come didn't in back, back to you. To you. Uh, when you say that two repairs do repair, and I agree with that, would you wait a certain amount of time before the MRI scans? You know, because if you do scan today and operate tomorrow, you will definitely find a tear. Yeah, so, so in terms of timing, um, uh, my priority is uh, that the knee is quiet and the patient is adequately prehabbed. So um, uh, uh, my indices for that is uh, no effusion, a full range of movements, um, symmetrical pain-free uh, gait, um, uh, and a pain-free knee. Uh, that can take as long as six to eight weeks, and it can be as short as two weeks, and it depends on the injury pattern and, and, and the individual. Um, uh, within my practice, I aggressively biologically enhance the tear environments for healing, which includes all the things that have been mentioned, including tear, rasping, trephination, and non-articular notch microfracture where repair is being performed in the absence of ACL reconstruction. But I think that the environment wants to heal. Um, you know, you only have to um, let the tourniquet down and see how much blood there is in that, in that, in that joint um, it, to, to realise how pro-healing and biologically active that space is. <clears throat> and I'm sure we've all um, uh, scoped uh, I'm sure we've we've all scoped um, uh, chronic bucket handle tears, and in our attempts to reduce those tears, we find that at the anterior and posterior horns, where there is white meniscal tissue opposed against white meniscal tissue, there has been healing and fibrosis of men white meniscal tissue, white zone meniscal tissue against white zone meniscal tissue. You know, and it's that that requires releasing to get the tear to reduce. Um, you know, so my, my, my point is, it's an environment that wants to heal if we give it the opportunity and put the right things in place. Um, uh, for me, I don't feel that, that in my hands, I can make fibrin work. Um, uh, and I, don't, and I, I feel that um, uh, injectables uh, are, are a step too far in my practice. Th thank you, Adil. Ian, you'll have one minute to talk. And while you talk, I'm then going to ask all the other faculties, starting from the top, to give one or two pearls of wisdom, and then we'll end this webinar. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I was just going to touch on something that Martin mentioned, which I think is interesting. And, and talking about you know, going a step too far, and I'm not saying it's too far, but it's certainly a big, big further step forward, is this concept of putting a, a collagen um, sheet over a repair, like a sheath, 
um, and also using BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate. So I reckon we're at this level. And if we had limitless resources and um, then, and if we could do everything that we wanted to without, without evidence to back it up yet, then I think there's that much we could be doing. So I think the, the idea of things like using um, things like Chondroguide um, and BMAC is interesting. And I think it's only a matter of time until some evidence potentially comes out to show whether or not that's actually an, another useful adjunct. Thanks, you, Martin, uh, Pearls of Wisdom. Pearls of Wisdom. Uh, just to throw the grenade in there uh, with Ian, actually in the, in the shoulder, when they compare PRP to PRF, actually the retail rate is higher if you add PRF than doing nothing. So just to throw that in there. Um, but the, the uh, in terms of which I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think you just got to try and the best, I actually, like Dave, actually, I've become a little bit more despondent about meniscal tears as I've got older. Um, and yeah, and that's maybe because I'm just seeing more failures um, of ones that you've attempted. Um, but I, I think you just have to work quite hard at trying to provide the best construct you can in your hands with whatever device you have. Um, and I think we probably have to work hard at prepare, preparation. Uh, that's the key, I think, is uh, trying to do all you can bio, you know, biologically as, as you can um, with what you have available and create the best construct. And uh, But probably the biggest thing is picking your winners, really, and making sure you have a stable lead etc cetera, etc cetera. so thanks martin paul i know we all repair younger patients uh, but would you try and repair all tears in somebody of our age group i'd repair if you had a bucket handle lateral meniscal tear i'd repair it um so my pearls we take your time do prep the site. It's not just putting the fast fix in or the, the air device and high-fiving yourself. That's not going to allow this to heal. Um, and don't ignore the root tears. I know people have done a 1,000 ACL reconstructions and said they've never seen a root tear, but as you know, the root's seen them. So, yeah, don't ignore those. Thank you. Neil? Yeah, well, I'm going to nick a couple of pearls of wisdom, actually. I'm going to nick one from Dave Pemberton there. I think the thing that resonated most with me from, from what he said was the discussion with your patient and actually in try and involve them as much as they can. And I think, you know, it sounds obvious, but in a busy NHS clinic, that's quite difficult to do sometimes. Uh, and the other thing, I suppose, Pearl of Wisdom, top tip, we all walk at different speeds naturally. We're all write with the same pen in a different handwriting. So I think what's quite crucial is that there's enough out there in terms of techniques and implants that we can find the one that works well in our hands. Uh, and once you find it, use it. Thank you. David? Um, I think I echo the comments already made. I think a few technical points we've, we have discussed, but to emphasize, um, do you be open to making further portals? If you, if you can't get the right angle of attack, then you won't get the implants in. We've talked a lot about biology in the last part of the seminar. I still think it's really important to get the meniscal devices in the right place. So make portals. Um, if you're skiving off a meniscus, a spinal needle may make a little pilot hole for you. It's probably the sharpest thing you've got. Um, and that may allow you to get that implant in the right sort of place. Um, you can use your know, vertical tear, use pass through one side and then reduce the tear as you pass through the other side. Um, and this is a difficult operation. I think it's very easy to put the devices into the knee. I think it's very difficult. I think it's one of the harder operations we do as a knee surgeon to do a meniscal repair well. So don't be despondent, you know, if you're getting failures or if you're finding it difficult. I think, you know, this is harder than doing an ACL. So just sort of stick with it. And, and also I think when, um, you know, when COVID improves and we can get back to the labs, take advantage of industry support and get in a cadaveric lab and, and practice these techniques because there's enormous support from industry and I think we need to embrace that when opportunity allows, really. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Ian, three sentences, please. I agree with the above. That's one. Some you got some very, very, 
very wise, very experienced, very sensible opinions from the other guys, and I completely agree with it. Thank you, Ian. That's very good. Adil? Uh, so in terms of pearls, um, I would say two things. Uh, the first thing is um, uh, there's been many uh, how challenging it can be to use some of these devices sometimes um, uh, and, and the, the failure rate in your hand. And I think it's important to bear in mind that there are three parts of that equation. There's your hands, there's a device, and then there's a tissue itself. And, and sometimes it can be difficult. Um, uh, but finding what works in your hands is really important. Um, all of our industry colleagues have fantastic cadaveric labs. And nowadays, there's no reason why, you know, you can't get excellent exposure in, in a high fidelity um, simulation environment uh, and get comfortable with, with the implants and the techniques. Um, uh, and the last pearl of wisdom I'd say um, is that um, meniscectomy in children must always be the second operation. There is no place for meniscectomy in the first visit in a child's knee. Thank you, Adil. Very important. Tembo? Uh, thanks, yeah. Um, I don't think I've been to a meeting when uh, as many people have agreed with my comments as I've had before. It's, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, we're not all dull in Wales. There's occasional bright Welshmen that have come out from here in the past. And, I knew there was uh, a Moroccan in you. As is badly, as is a suture. Put it there, it's gone, right? All right. Um, so, you know... Best, uh, Best decision Jeremiah. you've ever made, though, Pembo, is to shave off that moustache. Oh, yeah, well, it was the, it was the uh, 80s. It was, it was real. <laughs> um, so the biology is an important factor. We've got to get the mechanics right. If you haven't got the mechanics stable, it's not going to heal. If you put perfectly good mechanics in it, it's got a chance to heal. A bit like bone has, older bone, non-unions. We stabilise the whole thing up. Uh, preserve meniscus, same as we're preserving hyaline cartilage, we're preserving the natural tissue as much as we can do. The days of getting aggressive have gone. Um, do what's best in your hands. There's more than one way to skin a cat. The, the kit is excellent. The, I reinforce what you just said, uh, deal about going and learning this on a cadaver in a lab before you stick it in your own patients. And patient expectations, yes, agree. Uh, that's what we need to tell them. Just, and if you get it wrong, the lawyers will say it's your operation that's failed. If you take the meniscus out day one and they get arthritis 15 years later, it's their fault on the injury. If you have three operations trying to repair it and then they get arthritis, as far as they're concerned, it's your fault. Expectations. Thank you very much. Can I have slides, please? And then we'll get the faculty back again. Uh, really like to thank all the delegates and the attendees who have waited for this webinar and I've stuck there on this time. Next slide, please. So really like to thank the faculty who have taken the time out on this Saturday during this lockdown period to talk to us about the Meniscal Webinar Repair Device. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the industry who helped us to reach out to these faculty. Thank you. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank Rahul, Kiran, Randy, and Chaitanya who have helped me in this webinar today. Thank you to you. Next slide, please. Thank you to the BIOS office bearers, Amit Tolat, Sunil Garg, and Manish Bhatia, and to our president, Bijendra Singh, who really helped to set up this webinar. We'll go back to the faculty. So, Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed this webinar. Thank you for the delegates. Dear Kunwabar. Thank you.